Bishop James Cowan. Uh, uh, you know, you know that he's from Saskatchewan, the great province Yay! of Saskatchewan. <laughs> um, you may not know that in 1968 he won a 4-H award for the best looking bull. <laughs> You know, you know that he graduated from the Shota House, the seminary in Wisconsin. You may not know that in 1977, he won the award for the best dressed graduating student. <laughs> and of course, he's been, he's been busy, but the bishops, bishops um, need to have diversions uh, to lighten the load. And so you may not know that one of his private passions is model railroading. And that he recently he recently won the president's award for the Pacific Northwest region of the National Model Railroad Association, signaling um, signaling outstanding service to the hobby of model railroading over the last twelve years. <laughs> I welcome, I welcome the award, the multiple <laughs> award winning Bishop James Cowan. I don't know whether that introduction should go into the great <laughs> realm of mythology or, uh, or outright lie. Uh, he, Chris at one point said, uh, what do you want me to say about you when I introduce you? I said, I don't care, make it up. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, if I get the computer open, we can do this. I've been thinking about this for a little while, but I'm challenged with regard to things like this. It doesn't it doesn't go over my ear and make me look like Madonna. It doesn't actually work. Um, the book of Jonah and the movie Life of Pi speak, I believe, to the present as well as to the future of the church. I hope in this address to help us to consider how the view of a prophet outside the walls of Nineveh and of a shipwreck survivor cast up on a beach in Mexico challenge our view of mission and survival. How do we view faithfulness against all odds? In the book of Exodus, the departure of the people of Israel from Egypt is described as the departure of six, some 600,000 people, not including children. And as well, chapter 12, verse 38 says, a mixed crowd also went with them, and livestock in great numbers, both flocks and herds. A mixed crowd, not a unified people. Those delivered from Egypt had yet to be forged and molded into a nation. Three months after they leave Egypt, they come to the wilderness of Sinai, and prior to the delivery of the law, the people are consecrated to the Lord. Moses is told to tell the people, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. The Egyptian slaves, inclusive of the descendants of the patriarchs and matriarchs, as well as of what is described as a mixed crowd, through the common experience of relief, release from slavery, escape through the Red Sea, reception of the law of God at Sinai, and wandering in the wilderness before entering the land of promise, are forged into a nation. 
a people with a purpose. The purpose of this priestly kingdom is to be the storytellers to the world about the God of all in the world. It is God's world. All that is, is God's. And here is a people that are to let others know that they know this. The storytellers to the world about the God of all are a treasured priestly nation which have been given the task of reminding the world who God is and what our relationship to God is to be. It is a fairly simple task. Minister in the world, having concern even for its cattle and its herds. The world, God's possession, humanity and the environment. Yes, seemingly a simple, fairly simple task. So why do we have the book of Jonah? The book of Psalms, the letter to the Philippians and the Gospel of John and the book of Jonah are my favorite books in scripture. You can scrap the rest. <laughs> the book of Jonah is a good yarn. And if you have not read it recently, you should. It has action, adventure, passion, anger, emotion, all in good mixture. You have the prophet Jonah called by God to proclaim return to God to the people of Nineveh. Jonah does not want to do this. And attempting to escape God, Jonah takes passage on a ship to Tarshish. A storm at sea reveals Jonah's plot and plan. He is tossed overboard and swallowed by a great fish, spewed up by the fish, or I'm told another version says vomited up by the fish. <laughs> Jonah grudgingly goes to Nineveh and does what God has called him to do. And the people of Nineveh listen to him. They turn to God, and God does not destroy them. And Jonah is mightily ticked off. It's a good story that gets its point across that the whole world is God's. And Israel is not to be a people set apart from the world, but are called to be people who are storytellers to the world about the God of all. The world of the time of the prophet Jonah was a world that had reduced itself to tribalism, nations, and states. The gods were the gods of a family, the tribe, or the state. The authority and power of the gods were believed to be confined to defined boundaries confined to defined boundaries, the territory of the tribe or nation or state. And to be outside that territory meant being outside of the jurisdiction and power of the God. For God to call a prophet of Israel to go to Nineveh to proclaim repentance and forgiveness is to go against these cultural beliefs. Initially, readers or hearers of the book of Jonah would question the God's authority and purpose in making such a call to Jonah. Jonah flees Israel by sea for Tarshish. A raging storm hits the boat. The sailors call on Jonah to include his God in their prayers for safety and deliverance. The sailors then try to determine whose fault is the storm, and their divination points to Jonah. Jonah confesses that his God is the God of all creation. The sailors then point out how Jonah has brought disaster upon them by trying to escape the one who is inescapable. The storm is calm as Jonah is tossed overboard. He is swallowed by a great fish, while the non-Israeli sailors offer sacrifice to the Lord and make vows to him. And from the belly of the fish, Jonah sings a psalm of thanksgiving to God, the one who is the ultimate deliverer. Jonah completes his praise of God 
is spewed up on dry ground where he is called once again to go to Nineveh, and he does so. The people of Nineveh hear Jonah's proclamation and repent in sackcloth, they and their animals. Not only are the people of Nineveh saved, but the creation in the form of the animals is renewed, and Jonah is not happy. Jonah <coughs> sees what is happening and turns in on himself in his unhappiness. His confused unhappiness has him condemning God for doing just what God has told him he would do. <coughs> Israel's alienation from both God and the world are highlighted in this passage, and Jonah's unreasoning anger over both the deliverance of Nineveh and the death <coughs> and withering of his shade tree are shown to be in opposition to God's concern for the people of this world and for the environment. <coughs> Jonah is repro reproved by God, and the whole book becomes a recall of the people of Israel to their storytellers to the world about the God of all status. In the book of Exodus, the consecration of the people comes before the delivery of the law and Sinai. <coughs> and I believe that that is important because the consecration of the people of Israel concerns their relationship with the living God and the world created by God, not a series of things to or not to do. The function of the people of Israel is to proclaim that relationship and to show the world how it can live within the unity of God and God's creation. Failure to do this requires Jonah and the book of Jonah to remind the people of God's mission and to call them to return to that mission in the world. The Apostle Peter in the first letter of Peter, picks up this theme of the mission of God's people. Peter writes to those first Christians, Jewish and Gentile believers together, and reminds them of what God has done. Come to him, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own possession in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Here again, it is through no action on our part, the one who says, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself, now says, come to him, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight, and like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house. And again, there is the call to witness to the nations not as a people set apart, but as God's own treasured possession. The work of the church is the same work as that of the people of Israel. Indeed, the church is to be the new Israel, and from the earliest times has been called by that name. But to be the new Israel does not mean that the church replaces the people of the first covenant nor that it is now set apart from the world. The ideas of finding fault, judging, and saying, I'm, I am the best, are alive and well in the world. These are the shadow or the dark side of perceiving and believing that one has a particular task in relation to God and God's world. The shadow or dark side of our perception and belief is, I believe, seen in the movie of the life, the life of Pi. Pi is a young man with a simple but complicated name. His name is Piscine, French for swimming pool. But because he is teased and Piscine becomes pissing, 
he changes his name to Pi with its complicated mathematical explanation, which he goes to great pains to show and explain in the movie to his schoolmates. The movie begins with a garden, a zoo, and a people set apart, Pi's family. Pi sees God in all places and in all things, and explores the God of the universe that is revealed existing in the mouth of Krishna. Pi contemplates the mystery of the dying Son of God as found in Christ, and re revels in the Allah of regular prayer. Pi is supported, taught, and encouraged by his mother, taunted and reviled by his brother, and called to a rational life as expressed in science by his father. Pi explores the world of the zoo and is almost mesmerized by a magnificent Bengal tiger, which, through the error of a shipping clerk, has been named <coughs> Richard Parker. Pi contemplates whether animals have souls and sees himself connected to them in ways that his father tries to refute. But even in the midst of religious and rational conflict, life is good until the city determines that the zoo has to be closed and the property revert to becoming being a garden. So Pi's father decides to immigrate to Canada, selling the animals to zoos in North America and taking both his family and some of the animals by boat to the Americas. But a storm at sea causes the ship to sink, and all to be lost at sea except for Pi, a zebra, a hyena, an orangutan, and the tiger. The ship, its crew, Pi's family, and all the remainder of the zoo animals, all are dead. Only those five remain, a lifeboat to their world, a world spun in violence, as the hyena kills the zebra, the orangutan clubs the hyena, the hyena kills the orangutan, and Richard Parker then kills the hyena and eventually eats them all. Only the tiger, Richard Parker and Pi, are left. But after a brief and violent encounter with the tiger, Pi leaves the lifeboat for a life raft that he constructs. He makes occasional forays into the lifeboat for supplies, but violence continues to be the sub-theme between him and Richard Parker until Pi take, uh, takes on the training and subjection of the tiger. And then there is landfall on a lush, meerkat-inhabited island, and it is almost the end of both Pi and Richard Parker, because it is a carnivorous island. Pi discovers this and gets them away from the island to the comparative safety of the foodless and waterless lifeboat. The lifeboat with a nearly dead Pi and Richard Parker comes ashore on a Mexican beach. The tiger leaves the lifeboat and without looking back disappears into the Mexican jungle, never to be seen or heard of again. Pi, collapsed on the beach, is rescued hospitalized and restored to life. But his story is disbelieved by those investigating the sinking of the ship. So Pi is compelled to tell another story, where in that story the hyena becomes an angry, vicious member of the ship's crew. The zebra is a pacifist vegetarian sailor with a broken leg who is murdered by the other crewmen and cannibalized. The orangutan becomes Pai's mother, who dies in defense of the broken-legged sailor. And Pai is the tiger, who avenges his murdered mother. Their experiences of violence and death 
replace the story of Pi and the animals, a story which, as I said, is more palatable to the investigators into the sinking of the ship and Pi's survival. Pi has told this story to the whole story, to a struggling author, and faced with the author's questions, asks, after both stories have been told, which story do you prefer? The story with the animals, says the author. It's the better story. Thank you, says Pi, and so it is with God. I have only seen the movie. I've not yet read the book, but I intend to do so. And I will be interested to see how closely aligned the movie is with the book, though I am told that it is well aligned. But it was the movie that made me think of the story as metaphor for the church, faith, belief, and the world. Pi is the believer, seeking, journeying, but comfortable. He is the all-inclusive child of God who dislikes his pejorative nickname, Christ follower or Christian, a name first given in Antioch, and changes it to one with a complicated explanation, Orthodox, Eastern, Greek, Catholic, Western, Latin, Roman, Lutheran, Zwinglian, Church of England, Anglican, Methodist, Presbyterian, Missionary Alliance, or whatever. There is always a complicated reason for the name and for the Christian. And Christian, while used, is, I believe, actually disliked because of its pejorative beginnings, and it's not nearly complicated enough. We will learn from everyone and argue with no one. We will attempt to see for ourselves even where there is danger, or perhaps because there is danger. Pi attempts an eye-to-eye -eye encounter with the tiger, Richard <coughs> Parker, even though he has been told to stay away. You see, Richard Parker is the evil in the world and must be avoided at all cost, until, stuck in a lifeboat with it, we try to separate ourselves from it define our own territory as Pi attempts to do, and finally, we turn the church into a life raft from which we make forays into the world, the world of the lifeboat, to take what we can in order to survive. Occasionally, we try to confront the evil we see. At times, we are lured by the lushness of other life but we return to the world we know because, at base, we are part of the world we know and it is part of us. And ultimately, we are able to acknowledge that. However, as we struggle with the world, we become so invested with it that we believe it owes us at least a last glance of acknowledgement. And we are ticked when it doesn't do that. In both the book of Jonah and in the movie Life of Pi, there is struggle between the world and the treasured possession. In the, life of Pi, in the book of Jonah, the world is Nineveh, its people and its animals. In the life of Pi, the world is Richard Parker, the tiger. And the treasured possession of Jonah is Jonah. And the treasured possession of Life of Pi is Pi. Both Jonah and Pi miss the point, seeing the world through the eyes of <coughs> self rather than through the eyes of God. Both Jonah and Pi are angered by a God who seems to follow through with forgiving and giving life, but who seems to ignore them. Remember, for Jonah and Pi, substitute church. The Ninevites are more important than Jonah's comfort, and the God in whose mouth the universe exists does not stop to answer Pi's every question and query about justice and fairness. 
both Jonah and Pi are required to return to the story. Jonah is asked, and should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city, in which are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also many animals? And Pi, in hospital, is asked to come up, come up with a story that is more acceptable to the underwriters and owners of the ship that sank. Having come up with such a story, he steps back into the sphere of faith and asks, which story do you believe? And with his author friend, he claims the first story because it is the better story, concluding that life with the God of the universe will always provide a life of better story. The church needs to recover the story it is to tell. We have tried to run away from the story, and we have tried to pass on a story that we believe to be more acceptable to those we want to listen to us. We forget that the story is God's, and in the telling of the story, God needs neither defense nor explanation. We try to compose liturgy that will attract those outside us, rather than engaging ourselves in close encounter with God. The novelty of the simplistic and changeable replaces that for which generations has opened the heart to God. We seem to have forgotten the existence of liturgy that caused ambassadors from Kiev to the court of the emperor in Constantinople to pro exclaim, we have glimpsed heaven. A liturgical experience that brought about the conversion of Vladimir and Olga and formed the basis for what is called the baptism of the Russians. We seek to escape from the grip and power of God. And when we cannot, we cling to the shelter of the bush that provides shade, the safety of a life raft, or the novel program that is attractive and lush but which, end, which in the end has more to do than with death than with life. We expect, as God's treasured possession, to be better treated than we are. We expect the acknowledging, grateful glance of the tiger and the shady comfort of the broom tree. We expect the recipients of the food bank to be grateful, and we expect the privileges of Christendom to continue. Tax exemption, perhaps, is one of the privileges that we expect to continue. And I actually think that the municipalities have it wrong in, in what they exempt for us. Our halls, rectories, parking lots, and acres of grass and trees are taxed, while our places of worship are exempt from taxation. What if it were the other way around? The place of worship taxed, and the areas of program for the communities of the church and the world, our parkland, study centers, food banks, night shelters, parking facilities, meeting places, etc. What if they were tax exempt? I believe, however, that all our property will soon be subject to taxation. And this will be put, and this will be but one more step to help us to divest ourselves of sites that we are so attached to that we cannot see life, work, or worship taking place in any site other than that which I and perhaps my family have chosen. <coughs> this divestment of property will move us from a multitude of properties more useful as museums than as centers of evangelism and engagement with the world, to centers of worship, learning, and discipleship. Herbie O'Driscoll says that the great centers of Christian spirituality, nurture, and renewal will be among us again. And perhaps this center is one of those sites. But those who wish it to be so 
also need to be prepared to fund these places because as pressure is brought to bear on diocesan, synodical, and parish budgets, even though this is a provincial church site, its funding will be cut even more than it has been. We need to be prepared individually to be supportive here. In our recovery of the story, we will once again recover the three-pronged thrust of religion, worship, care for the world, and spiritual nurture. Worship restores our focus on the one who formed us in the womb. It unites us in a fellowship of holiness and wholeness. It forges visible links that we have with God, with one another, and with the wider creation. Formal communal worship is more about visioning the God whose treasured possession we claim to be than it is about me, my individualism, my likes, and my desires. If it was left to me, we would never sing a hymn again in the life of the church. I don't like them. I, anyway, so, but it's not about me. Therefore, we sing hymns. Worship calls us, calls the individual and knits or grafts the individual into the whole. Worship is to be more about us than about me. Worship is not about fuller churches with more money on the plate. Worship is about engaging the community of faith in an encounter with the living God. Care for the world embodies the giving of a cup of cold water in my name. It is response and service to a hurting and broken world in order for there to be hope, wholeness, and health. It is a church in which there are more deacons and fewer presbyters. Care for the world asks the orangutan in the life of Pi, where is your son? And sorrows with her when she looks into the ocean at nothing. Care for the world rejoices that the environment is being cared for and engages us in a multicultural, multi-religious world and asks that we work as people of faith, with people of faith, with people of no faith, and with people of goodwill for the transformation of the unjust structures of society. Care for the world compels us to be engaged politically. There is no such reality as separation of church and state. And we need to resist any move towards such a separation as vigorously as we would resist our subjection to any one religious pers perspective or ism. Care for the world is not about evangelism. It is about discipleship. It is about us, and it is about me, and how it is that we are engaged for good with the world and the creation of which we are part. The place of the church is to encourage and support me to support us in these endeavors, and at times helping to give voice to the voiceless, the marginalized, and the oppressed. Spiritual nurture concerns our connection to the divine, to one another, and to the whole of creation. Spiritual nurture seeks to give flesh and voice to the expression, indeed the whole world is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. How is this so? Why is this so? What does each of these things mean? Study methods of prayer and spiritual expression, spiritual gifts, evangelism, pastoral care, apostolic teaching, all are included in spiritual nurture. To engage fully in spiritual nurture, we are required to work together. Isolation of <coughs> parochial systems needs to be broken down, and the spiritual gifts of the wider community engaged 
yes, and even diocesan structures and boundaries need to be broken down. Clergy and laity that see beyond boundaries of parish system or diocesan system need to engage with one another in joint effort. The church of a future is engaged more with possibility than with prob problemability and more with that which enables to community to rise than that with the ability of the individual to shine. Individuality and uniqueness of gift is encouraged for the strengthening and building up of the whole rather than the enabling of the cultus of personality. The Book of Jonah and the movie Life of Pi speak to the present as well to the future of the church. I hope in this address that I have helped us to consider how the view of a prophet outside the walls of Nineveh and of a shipwrecked survivor cast up on a beach in Mexico challenge our view of mission and survival. I hope that I have presented a vision of God's call to faithfulness against all odds. Thank you.